Oh, if I had my life to live over again, I wouldn't change it one bit insofar as my belief in the need that each and every one of us should contribute to public life. Sir John said, you know, I'm one of those who believes in prayer, excepting when the prayers are, are uttered by the grit. Because he said, if their prayers were answered, not only would I be sick, but long since would have joined my ancestors in another place altogether remote. <laughs> but he said, my, my immediate purpose is to see what can be done uh, to bring about a change uh, in the government of this country that I have been referred to in the most disparaging terms. In that connection may I say that that was before the days of biographies in 1963 published <laughs> in Canada and I want to say this to you Davy, that when another biography is written, I want you for my biographer, <laughs> along with the assistant of John Pitt. <laughs> he speaks the truth. That's what we want. So naturally, I want to see him go back. Definitely a good prime minister. Well, I figure he's a good man for the country. As a leader? Uh... I don't think too much of him as a leader. I think he's a little old now. It doesn't look too bad now, but uh, he's, an, he's an older man and he's had his time. All right, now, who's got the first question? Sir, uh, have you read your book lately? <laughs> first chance we in Vancouver, I'd like to ask you specifically if you would like to uh, spell out some of the mythology in uh, Newman's book, Renegade and Power. Oh, I, have you not read that? I naturally can't answer that. And you having read it will be able to give your own answer because knowing you as I do, Jack, I'm sure that you have an answer for all the, most of the questions that appeared therein. You just decided not to read it at all? No, I, I, I devote myself to reading those things that I believe will be, will give, be of some benefit. Hey, I would have thought you'd have glanced through it, sir, just out of sheer curiosity. That curiosity is essential to your business, but not to mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> Do you hope and uh, expect to lead the Conservative Party to victory at the next uh, federal well, election? Put it this way. Eight, uh, eight Prime Ministers of Canada have subsequently served as leaders of the opposition. Two of them, MacDonald and King, again retrieved the position of being the Crown's First Minister. That's an objective that I have in mind. Mm -hmm. That's an objective that I hope, in the light of events, and with the passing days, I can tell you that that hope increases. Well, sir, thanks very much. Uh, I think his big fault was he couldn't build a team around him. He had a good vision, good ideas, but he couldn't put his own ideas into effect. We'd had very good relations with Deef while he was in opposition. And we were trying hard to get a pr press conference laid on. And finally, I bearded Grossart downstairs in the cafeteria in this hotel. And I said, what about her? We're going to get the Prime Minister or we're not going to get the Prime Minister? He says, when the chief is here, only the chief speaks and the chief's not speaking. <laughs> so you couldn't get near him when he was Prime Minister out on the coast here. Back, he's now the campaigning politician, lovable John Deef in Baker. <laughs> This hurts the grits. They don't like to hear this story. And it's tonight I'm just reviewing in a friendly way the situation. Now I 
speak seriously again. Mr. Gordon, they call it the dialogue today. They go to Washington. I remember one time Mr. Pearson said to me, he said, any time I pick up the phone, I can call the president any time. And I said, yes, so can you. And you, but will he answer? <laughs> so can you, but will he answer? And will they answer, that's the question. It's a winter daybreak on Vancouver Island. The man is 68. He's going fishing. Just seven years ago, by the sheer power of his persuasion and the force of his personality, this man swept his party into office. He formed the first conservative government in 23 years. Then, just as suddenly, power slipped from his grasp. One year ago, he suffered mutiny in his cabinet, defeat in the Commons, disaster in an election. Now he's leader of the opposition, and no Canadian is under such constant and bitter attack. It's a fascinating study in psychology, isn't it? I wonder what a psychiatrist would say about a man who deliberately planned not to read a book which may have helped to bring about the total end of his political career. And I certainly think that any intelligent conservative who reads the book has got to lose total faith in John. Oh, oh, in the old days, one of the great speeches in the House of Commons was delivered in 1910 or 11 by La Fortune, Montreal member. In those days, there was no restriction on the time. At the end of 14 hours and 10 minutes, he said, I, I now have laid the basis for the argument I intend to advance. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's very much like fishing in some ways. Yeah, it's more certain to catch in the House of Commons in here. <laughs> You're going to catch something. You're going to catch something, that's for sure. Was this man a liberal, did you say, or a conservative? The oh, talk for 14 hours. Uh, liberal. Liberal. <laughs> it takes them longer to explain. <laughs> For this man, politics is not a vocation. Politics is his passion, his meat and drink. His earliest ambition was to become prime minister. His present ambition is the same. Today he's been on his feet 11 hours, trudging the rough banks of the Qualicum in search of a steelhead. He's a good fisherman, but today the steelhead eludes him, takes the bait from someone else's hook. The fisherman is not discouraged, for he's accustomed to defeat. He learned from his prairie boyhood that nothing is gained without persistent effort, that defeat is often the necessary prelude to victory. But no climb is so long or so hard as the climb back to power. In his 68 years, he's known many defeats, but none so bitter as that April Monday in 1963 when he was swept from office after six years as prime minister. For his party, it was not a total disaster. Only once before had the conservatives held on to so many seats in opposition. But John Diefenbaker has committed the unforgivable political sin, defeat in office. Now the old wolf is under savage attack from his own pack. 
The perk was gone, the fish are landed by others, and doors that once sprung open are now closed to him. Would you like some dry socks? Put on no, your... I'm just fine. Those your socks? Uh, no, I think those are Bill's. Uh, Bill, <laughs> whose who's are these boots? Those are mine. They're yours, all right. I get all squared away here. Anybody for coffee? Well, these are. Will you have a sandwich there? No, no thanks. Oh, uh, it's all right. mm. No, it's been wonderful. It's been a great day. Great day. Uh, 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 he's got everything. He's got, he sure has. And, yeah, and it's all piled in the back. <laughs> Is this his license? No, that's a gas bill. I better put that up there for him. <laughs> we appreciate it. On the floor. But to see Mike out in the stream participating in the chase, <laughs> I was trying to kick it off his line. <laughs> I helped myself. That water was too deep to get a good kick at it. <laughs> well, well how'd it? you get along? We have another. We'll have oh, a coffee. Hit. One cup. I couldn't. I couldn't quite hear. I hit two and lost them both. You did. <laughs> We're up the top. I right, cut it out, Harold. They're, they're still waiting. They. <laughs> huh? You have no sympathy from me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, if you don't hook the trees or hook the bottom, you're not fishing. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I was fishing. <laughs> the day's fishing over, the chief settles back in his seat for the long drive over the mountains. Little is said at first but the road home warms his spirits. Very fast. They're both very fine fellows. Good fishing companions? Oh, good fellows. Great philosophers. <laughs> oh, he was a great, a great man, this H.Y. <laughs> Sir John was in a class by himself. Some of his stories the one that illustrates the way in which he pushed aside those that he didn't want around him. Yet it can't be told. There's a well-known colonel from one of the towns close to Ottawa, I think it was Perth, who wanted a certain job. And he persistently took up a position in the, in the doorway that Sir John would enter. And finally, one day, Sir John said, I never want to see you again. Get. Be gone. Two weeks passed by. Sir John came out of his office with Sir John Carling and Sir Hector Langevin. There was the colonel. Sir John said, I'm so glad to see you. The three of us have been discussing a problem, problem in engineering, military engineering. And you're quite an authority on the subject. You served in India, didn't you? Yes, sir. Nishanti. Yes, sir. And where else? And the colonel retailed where he had been. You're the man for me. Our problem is one of great difficulty, I ask you for your solution. How much gunpowder would one have to put under a bull's tail in order to blow his horns off? <laughs> he never saw the colonel again. <laughs> Sunrise, Nanaimo, B.C. The chief is up before six, takes his morning walk 140 paces to the minute. 